Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Felder, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. And again, it's good to be back with everybody and good to have all of our student studio people with us. We know that you've come from far and wide, and we do appreciate the fact that you come in. And again, to our television audience, we just want you to feel at home and like you're sitting right in with our class. Take your Bible, and we trust you'll follow these references with us, because after all, all we try to show is what the book says, not what I think or what someone else thinks, but how we can prove from scriptures that this book is so unique, it is so miraculous, and it's so interesting to study. Again, we like to remind those of you out in television that our book number two is now ready for mailing. If you'd like to have a copy of it, which of course will be the second six hours of videotapes transcribed, you write to us and uh, we'll be glad to send you one. I'm always being reminded to let folks know that we don't have a big budget to operate on. We have no one operating, uh, underwriting us. And so if you can, we appreciate approximately $5 per copy. That's what they cost us. We don't make anything on them, but uh, in order to save every penny that we can for airtime, we appreciate any help you can give us in that regard. We always like to make it understood that no one takes any money out of this ministry for salaries or compensation. Everything goes to just do the expenses and buy the airtime, and, and we tro trust that we can branch out and reach more and more people. Now again, for those of you here in the studio and for those of you joining us, we're going to go back to Daniel chapter 9, and uh, like one of my classes during the week, I almost feel as though they get sick and tired of hearing that when we're going back to Daniel 9. But it is a portion of Scripture that is almost impossible to exhaust, and if you want to be a student of prophecy, this is one of the places you have to start because this is the foundation of all the rest of end time events. And you remember we were in it the last two or three weeks of our programs, and I always have to kind of be reminded for you folks here in the studio, you know, from one half hour to the next is just a ten minute break away. But for those on television, of course, it's a whole week, and uh, sometimes that's hard to remember. But for those of you here now, we'll come back to Daniel chapter 9, and you remember here is the prophecy in time of a 490-year period in which God is going to bring Israel all the way from coming out of the Babylonian captivity to the coming of Christ to the nation of Israel as we now know happened in the uh, book of Matthew. But here in Daniel chapter 9, in this 490 years, it's broken down into three distinct areas of time. Now we're going to pick it up <clears throat> in uh, verse 25, because we spent a good deal of time on the first uh, verse, 24, how that it brought us all the way up to the work of the cross, the finishing of the transgression, the making end of sins, and reconciliation, and so forth. Now verse 25, as we move on, know therefore, and understand. Now you see, that's clear language. Does God want us to be in a fog on these things? Why no. The, the command here is to know these things, and not to be waffling, and not to be carried around with every wind of doctrine, but we can study and we can know. Know, therefore, and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto or until the Messiah, the Prince. Now, the reason I take so long in Daniel 9 is because we have to stop constantly and, and remind you what to look for. Now, watch that word Prince. It's capitalized. So this Prince is, of course, the Prince of Peace, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, it's the reference to the coming of the Christ. That's why it's capitalized. So from the time of the going forth to build Jerusalem. Now you've got to stop a moment and look back in history. Several weeks ago we pointed out that in 606 B.C., what happened at Jerusalem? Well, the Babylonians under Nebuchadnezzar, you remember, came and besieged the city destroyed not only the city but also the temple 
took all of the things in the temple, the holy things, and carried them back to Babylon, as well as, for the most part, the people of Israel. And you remember we referred to that then as the beginning of the times of the Gentiles. Now that was 606 B.C. Now we know they were in captivity there for 70 years. So I guess I can go to the board and, and maybe put it out a little plainer. You remember that in 606 B.C., Babylon became the first of the Gentile empires and besieged Jerusalem and, and took them captive. Then you remember we pointed out that Jeremiah had prophesied that they would be there in captivity for 70 years. Now you remember we're in B.C., so these numbers are coming down from greater to smaller. So the end of the 70-year captivity, I hope I can do my simple arithmetic better than I did a few weeks ago, but this would be 536 B.C. is the end of the 70 years when Ezra will be the leader of the Jews coming out of captivity back to Jerusalem, not to build the city per se, but to rebuild what? The temple. Because after all, that was paramount that they could be reestablished in their temple worship or in the uh, system of law given to Moses years before. Now, that's 536 B.C. But now you'll notice that in verse 25, it does not refer to Ezra's commandment to rebuild the, the temple, but it refers to another commandment to rebuild the city and the wall. Now you see the difference? Ezra went back to rebuild the temple back here in 536, but now we have another element of time, and it's in history, that they were to go back now and rebuild the temple. Now, that's Nehemiah chapter 2. So if you'll come back to Nehemiah. Nehemiah, of course, is way back in the books of history. <laughs> we got the Kings and the Chronicles, and then Ezra, which is the account of the remnant coming back from Babylon, the building of the temple. But then the next book is Nehemiah. Nehemiah, and drop in at chapter 2. Nehemiah, chapter 2, and we'll just start right at verse 1. Now this is the commandment that Daniel is referring to in chapter 9, verse 25 that from the commandment to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, the city, the walls, the gates. Now you got Nehemiah chapter 2, and here's how chronologers arrive at these various times. Look at what it says. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, that's the month of April in the spring, in the 20th year, see the time element? Now in the month of April, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, well now archaeologists as well as ancient history has given us an, a pretty good close date on when the 20th year of Artaxerxes really was. It was in the area of 454 B.C. Now I've got to move over to the side here because you see 454 is a larger number than five, or smaller number than 536, so we can subtract. And now we find that, what do we get? 82 years. 82 years go by from the beginning of the rebuilding of the temple under Ezra until the year 454. Now let me put this down here where we can all see it. In 454 B.C., is when Nehemiah chapter 2 comes on the scene, 454 B.C. Now, let's just read on so that you'll know what I'm talking about. In the 20th year of Artaxerxes, the king, wine was before him, and Nehemiah, of course, is a Jewish slave, servant, still under that uh, captivity out there in the Mesopotamian area. Now, remember, by this time, Babylon has fallen, the Medes and Persians have taken over the empire, and so instead of being in the palace at Babylon, they are now in the palace up at Shushan, which is up in the area of, uh, oh, northern Syria, north of present-day Baghdad, up on the Tigris River. So 
Daniel, of course, served down in the area of southern Babylon, down on the Euphrates River toward the Gulf where Babel was. But now you see, years later, Nehemiah is now serving the king of the next empire, which was the Medes and Persians up in Shushan. So now we're down to 454 B.C. And uh, verse 2, Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? It's nothing but sorrow of heart. And of course he was sore afraid because they had a tremendous fear of the kings in those days because they, they just didn't have much concern about human rights, you know. Anything could turn them off and they would just tell someone, well, kill him. He's of no use. And so Nehemiah was rightfully fearful. And so he says, I was sore afraid, verse 3, and I said to the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, Jerusalem, the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Now that all took place when Nebuchadnezzar besieged Jerusalem clear back in 606 B.C. So it's been laying waste all these years, 82 years even beyond the end of the captivities and when Ezra went back and began to rebuild the temple. But the city, for the most part, was still in shambles. Now read on. Verse 4, So the king said unto me, What dost thou make request? Well, now Nehemiah was a spiritual man, and so even there as he stands before that pagan king, what does he do? Well, he prays silently. And here again, this comes to this whole idea of prayer. Do you have to be someplace on your knees in order for God to hear you? Why no? Prayer is something that we can accomplish anywhere, anytime, even as Nehemiah, he wouldn't have dared spoken out loud before that king. But he prayed silently, see, from the heart. And so he says, I prayed to the God of heaven. And then as he was praying silently, he speaks now audibly to the king. And he said, If it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that thou would send me to Judah, to the city of my fathers, that I may build it. All right, now come back to Daniel chapter 9, and this is the time factor then. And this is the only reason we're doing this, is to show you how that all of this took place explicitly in a time factor. Now, that's the beauty of prophecy, that God is in such control of the whole business of human history that he can prophesy a thing in time and fulfill it in time. All right, so now if you're back in Daniel chapter 9, and again verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment, Nehemiah chapter 2 in 454 B.C., until Messiah the Prince, in other words, until the coming of Christ the first time, shall be, now like I said in my opening remarks, this 490 years is divided into three segments. Right here is one of them. And it'll be seven weeks. Now remember, these are sevens of years. So seven weeks of years would be how many years? Forty-nine. So from 454 B.C. Now again, let's go back and do some arithmetic, and I want you people to watch me because I'm not beyond making a, a mistake. So here, 49 years is that seven sevens. And that brings us now to should be 405, if I remember right. Does that look right? Now we're down to 405 B.C. Historically, this is the year that Ezra's temple is finally completed. Now, well, you know, we Americans, we wouldn't stand still for something that took that long, would we? But they worked, and they worked, and they worked. And finally, all the way from 536 B.C., clear up to 405. Now that's a total of over 100 years that that temple was a building. But finally in 405 B.C. now, they dedicate this temple. Now we refer to it as the second temple. The first one was whose? Solomon's. It was destroyed. So the temple is rebuilt now under Ezra and Nehemiah finally comes on the scene, of course. Over a hundred years of building until 405 B.C. I've got to keep putting that up there. 405 B.C., the temple 
is dedicated. Now, that's the seven years of that verse that the wall, now read on. The wall shall be built, or the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, if you go on and read the book of Nehemiah, we haven't got time in these few minutes that we're allotted for television, but if you'll read the book of Nehemiah, you'll notice that as they rebuilt the city wall and began to construct the gates, there was so much opposition from the Arabs at that time already, no different than it is today, that the Arabs, Tobias and Sanballat were two of them named, that they gave these Jews so much trouble trying to keep them from accomplishing what they're trying to do that Nehemiah finally says, I think it's in about chapter 6, that the workers had to actually work with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other. It'd be as if today you were under such constant pressure that you had to tote a six-gun on one hip and have a hammer on the other. But so it was then already. But they got it done, and they rededicated the second temple then in 405. All right, now let's read on in this verse, because I'm taking it slow so that you can see beyond a shadow of a doubt how these years are segmented. The 49 years are the seven weeks then, and the streets will be uh, built again. And now in verse 26, after three score and two weeks. Now that's how many? Well, that's another 62 weeks. And if you got your pencil handy, multiply times seven real quickly. And what do you get? How much? Oh, right, it's 62, but I mean, how many years would that give you? 400 and... Okay. 434, isn't it? Yeah, 434 years. Now, we're at 405 B.C. But we're going to go to 434 years left. So we have to put the smaller between the larger. So that brings us down to... 29, but you see we're coming from B.C. and we're going into A.D. You following me? So from 405 B.C. add 434 years, it takes you into 29 what? You with me? All right, what happened in 29 A.D.? That's right, Helen. Christ was crucified. 483 years from the commandment given to Nehemiah to rebuild the city, not Ezra, see that would throw off the timing, but from this commandment to rebuild the city under Artaxerxes in his 20th year until Messiah was cut off in 29 AD. Now, are you seeing what I'm trying to show? How accurate scripture is? Now, I always give people leeway I'm not saying that it had to be just exactly so many years, because, see, a lot of things come into play when you start dealing in chronology. Number one, I like to put this on the board for the benefit of our viewing audience as much as anything. You want to remember that a scriptural or a biblical year is 360 days. In other words, 12 30-day months. That's a scriptural or a biblical year. Now, that's real handy, except we've got a problem. And what is it? There's 365 and a fraction in every year. So what did the Jews do? Well, so far as we can tell, every few years, they would correct their calendar and make up for those five days. We do it, of course, with an extra day every so often. And in every fourth year, we have a leap year. Now, if you put a pencil to it or calculate it, you'll notice that over a period of 483 years, those extra five plus days can be quite a period of time, you see. So I don't get dogmatic and say, well, this is the exact number and this is the exact date, but I think you can see already that Scripture is so close that over the long pull, there's very little differential. And so the prophecy is exact that from the going forth of Nehemiah's commandment until Christ was crucified was 483 years. But those of you who have been with us in the previous weeks, the original statement down in verse 24 was there wouldn't be 483 years in this prophecy, but how many? 
490. Now what's lacking? Well, seven years. There's seven years. Now, let me go back to my timeline. Since seven years are still also included in this overall prophecy of Daniel, let's go back to a timeline again, if I may, and just come right straight up out of the Old Testament. And uh, from this point back here, from Nehemiah's commandment again, would be 490 years. But up to the cross was 483. So now on this side of the cross, we still have to take care of seven years, right? Now let's read on. Now you remember what I've been stressing for the last several weeks? There is nothing, nothing in the Old Testament or even in the Gospels, or even in the early chapters of Acts, and that's where we stopped last week, you remember, there is nothing to indicate that there's going to be 2,000 years between this and the end of the seven years. Not a hint. So we have to look at it coming out of the Old Testament as they saw it, and that was the 483 years, the crucifixion, and then what? The tribulation. All right, now let's read on. <coughs> After three score two weeks, verse 26, the Messiah shall be cut off, as we've already pointed out, not for himself. In other words, we know that Paul makes it so plain that he died for us and not for himself. He who knew no sin became sin for us, Paul writes. And the people, now here again, we've got to go real slowly. And the people of the prince, now what's on that word prince? A small letter P. So it's not the same prince as the one up in verse 25. So who is the small letter prince? It's the Antichrist. It's the counterfeit Christ that we know is going to come on the scene. Now, I've been mulling all this over for the last several weeks, and I've been looking, and as far as I can tell, there is no indication of the man of sin, the Antichrist, anywhere else in Scripture except here in Daniel, and we're going to see several references where Daniel gives his description. Jesus refers to him in Matthew 24. Paul describes him in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and other than that, we know nothing of the Antichrist until we get to the book of Revelation. Now, I may be wrong, but I'm quite sure that I'm, I'm right. But here, Daniel is revealing that this seven-year period is also going to be attended by an individual, a man, a prince that shall come. Not the prince of princes, the capitalized prince, but a prince, a lesser than God. But he's going to be the counterfeit. All right, let's move on. Now, the prince that shall come shall destroy the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary now what empire was responsible after babylon destroyed the first temple what empire destroyed the second temple the roman now again go back to daniel's or nebuchadnezzar's first nebuchadnezzar's uh, vision of all the metals that made up that huge image how many empires were there? Well, there were four. The head of gold was Babylon. The chest of silver was the Medes and the Persians. The belly of brass was the Greek. And the legs and the feet were the Roman. Four empires. Now, you also have to remember that in your timeline from 606 B.C., from way back here, all the way up through this period of time, up until here, you've covered all those empires. You've already had Babylon come and go. The Medes and Persians came and went. The Greeks came and went. And by the time we get to the cross, it's Rome. Isn't it? Now then, which empire was responsible for destroying the temple? The Roman Empire. And who would come out of that empire and be the prince that shall come? The Antichrist. So this is where we get the whole concept that the Antichrist will come from some place out of the geographical area of the old Roman Empire. Now, the Old Testament doesn't give us a hint that Rome would fall, disappear from scene, 
and then come back. We have to read that in between the lines. But whenever I teach this whole concept that the Roman Empire ended in between 3 and 400 A.D., and now it's coming on the scene again in our European community over there, and we see all the makings of a revived Roman Empire. Even though there has been 1900 and some years of time intervening, how long is that to our God? Snap of the finger. It's just as if it never happened. And so this is the concept that you have to look at, that the Scripture looks at the whole picture and the church age was placed in there without any mention whatsoever here in the Old Testament and the Old Testament goes right on as if the same empire that destroyed the temple is on the scene for the Antichrist it's because a thousand years with the Lord is but a day and a day is like a thousand years so it's just as if like I said 48 hours and the same empire that destroyed Jerusalem after Christ in 70 AD is the same empire that is going to bring forth the Antichrist. But we don't want to put the cart before the horse. Let, let's keep everything in its order. And now as we come down to the end of verse 26, this prince that shall come out of the Roman Empire, a revived one now, of course, and from his appearance until the end of time as we know it is going to be nothing but trouble. It's going to be war and desolations. Now that's the seven year period that Jesus refers to then in Matthew 24. And we'll be going to that probably in our next program. Where he says it's going to be a constant flood of false prophets claiming to be the Christ. And then in Matthew 24, he'll bring us right up to the midpoint of the tribulation, and he'll refer to verse 27. Our time is up, so we're going to have to stop here. But you see, verse 27, Daniel introduces to the man who will again kick God's time clock in gear, and those seven years will begin to roll. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Felding. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the Scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call 1-800-369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felder.